Good morning, church. I don't know who that was. Awesome right there in the fourth row. Good to see you guys this morning. I'll let the rest of you in now. Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to see you guys here today uh, as we finish up our last part of the series uh, that is entitled Ephesus. It's our 10th week of a 10-week series. Can you believe this thing's already blown by by this point? So uh, what we've been doing is we've been studying a city. If you're new to Christ's community, we haven't been looking at a particular book or a character. We've been looking at a city in the Bible, the city of Ephesus, and how it developed over the years. Because Ephesus, this is something not commonly known, was the center of the Christian faith from about year 100 to 300 AD. In between the time it went from Jerusalem to Rome, it was kind of the center of the Christian faith. And we're asking the question, what does it take to develop a disciple in the city of Ephesus? And then what does it take to develop a church that will engage an entire city? Because that's our dream, is that we would grow as disciples and as a church, that we would engage our city uh, to be more like Jesus. So uh, last week, this is the last week that we're doing related to that. Next week, we're going to be launching a brand new series called Questionable, Questionable. And uh, it's going to be different than some of the series that we've done in the past, because three of the weeks, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Some people would claim that every week I have no idea what I'm talking about, but this series, next week I've got a series plan, or I've got a message planned on talking about uh, asking questions, and during the service what we'll do is we'll give you the opportunity to text in any questions that you want about God, faith, Bible, Christianity. Like some services, I'll answer some of those questions during the service, but then we'll compile the questions. We'll find out what are the most common, most sticky, most difficult questions that are out there, and we'll pick a number of those questions, and the next few weeks, our services will be answering the questions that you guys ask. So you get to decide what is going to happen, what the sermons are going to be uh, during those weeks. Should be a pretty fun deal, so come next week with questions. And I'd encourage you to come next week with a friend who's got questions as well, because that's the kind of context, uh, that open dialogue that's really warm and welcoming to folks who would be new around here. So that's uh, what we're going to be doing starting next week. But for now, we're jumping into uh, taking a look at the city of Ephesus, and I'd love to pray for us as we jump into the message. Let's pray. God, we look to you as our king, as the Lord of the universe, as the one who wants to speak to us, and we gather together to worship you and to please you. So we pray that even the way that we listen to your word today would please you. We pray that your spirit would be speaking to us, and we pray that you'd convict us of things that need to change in our hearts for the sake of the kingdom. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we have uh, the city of Ephesus. And now we're going to be looking at the final place in the Bible that talks about the city of Ephesus. It's Revelation chapter 2. If you want to get ahead and turning in your Bible there, that's going to be our text for today. But let me give you a little bit of a backdrop or timeline just to review our series. It all started back in AD 51 when Priscilla and Aquila, a couple of tent makers, moved to the city of Ephesus in order to begin telling people about this Jesus who had risen from the dead. In AD 53, their friend Paul, who's also a tent maker and an apostle, comes into town, not only makes tents, but he begins to teach in the lecture hall of Tyrannus every single day. And Paul spent more time in the city of Ephesus than he spent in any other city on his missionary travels, somewhere between two and a half to three years in the years uh, 53 to 55 AD. So he taught them every single day, and that was the point where the church was established. A couple of years later, he he wandered out, and then he wandered back and said goodbye to the Ephesian elders. That was what we preached about last week uh, in uh, Acts chapter 20, and it was a very emotional, tearful goodbye, I'm never going to see you again, and he really did never see them again. But in AD 60, from a prison in Rome, he wrote a letter back to the Ephesian church called the Book of Ephesians, and we spent a number of weeks studying the Book of Ephesians. Somewhere between 60 and 64, his young apprentice Timothy was put in charge of the church at Ephesus. Not only was he the pastor of that church, but he became the bishop of Ephesus and all of Asia Minor. And so Paul sent him two letters teaching him, Timothy, here's how to be a good pastor. And the first book is called 1 Timothy, creative name, right? Called 1 Timothy, and it teaches him how to do good pastoral stuff. And the second book is called 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy written in 64. 2 Timothy was the last book that Paul ever wrote, the last letter that he wrote that we have recorded in the Bible just before he died in A.D. 67. 
And then finally, at the very end, you have John. Now, John is the very same John who way back here was a follower of Jesus. By AD 90, he's somewhere around 75, maybe 80 years old, and uh, John is exiled on an island called Patmos for being a Christian leader, a man of faith. He's the last living disciple of Jesus, and while he's there, he gets a revelation from God that we now know as the book of Revelation, and it was a book that was circulated to Ephesus and seven churches in that general area. That's what the book of Revelation was about. And in that book, it particularly addresses some of the issues that are going on in the city of Ephesus. Now, it's written to these... Oh, so the the whole compiled idea of, uh, of Ephesus is that you've got three different authors. Luke writes the book of Acts, this stuff in orange. Paul writes Ephesians, 1 and 2 Timothy. And then John writes uh, the book of Revelation. So you have 40 years, three authors, five documents. I should say seven documents and, uh, and five different leaders that you can see are key players in the Bible related to what's happening at the city, in the city of Ephesus. So the letter is written, Revelation is written, and what is put in that letter is chapter 2 and 3 have seven letters to seven different churches in Asia Minor. Those of you who have read the book of Revelation know that these are funky names like Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches. And you may wonder, why are these seven churches the ones that are included in the picture? Well, Ephesus was the first one mentioned and was the central church to all of these. And most people speculate that each of these cities had a church that was planted from the church at Ephesus in each of those cities. Not only that, but in the ancient world, this was an ancient postal route where a letter carrier would go from city to city. And in each of these cities, they had their surrounding areas where they would generally bring their letters to the post office, and you would be able to deliver letters all over Asia Minor just through this little postal route. So John, who's exiled on the island of Patmos, writes a letter that's going to be a circuit letter that goes to all seven of these churches and has certain words for each of those churches. Isn't that kind of cool to know that that's kind of the way that that God designed that and he put that all together? Well, each of those uh, has a letter that comes to them. And in chapter 1, there's this vision of one who is walking between the seven lampstands. What are the seven lampstands? Well, a lampstand is symbolic of a local church. And that one who's walking through the seven lampstands has seven stars that are in his hand. And those seven stars represent the seven angels, one for each of these local churches. Some people, some scholars will say those angels are actually angels, like divine messengers for each of those churches. Some of them think it's symbolic of a church leader. Uh, Scholars disagree. I don't really know what the answer is, but that's what it represents uh, in a general sense. And then walking in between the lampstands with these seven stars is Jesus himself. And he's described as having hair that's blazing like wool and eyes that are on fire and a bright white robe with a golden sash around it and feet that are like burnished bronze. I mean, Jesus is coming in power with a message for the churches. And this is how the message to the church at Ephesus starts. It says this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name. And have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is God's word for the Ephesian church, but I think that it's God's word for us as well. 
Because you see, the Ephesian church was at a place where it was 40 years old. And you know there's dynamics that happen in churches as they grow older. You guys, uh, anybody ever studied this stuff? You see certain dynamics? Because in churches that are brand new, Ephesus is no exception to this, there's oftentimes a lot of excitement when it very first bursts onto the scene. There's exciting new teaching, and there's relationships with new, te- with new people, and there's this Holy Spirit wildness that takes place, and nothing is really organized. There may not be effective leaders that are in place, but you're just doing best, your best with the resources that you have, and everything is very exciting in a brand new church plant, right? It's all a thrill, but as time goes by, somebody says, we cannot live with this insanity forever, we got to have leaders that are assigned to the right places, to right ministries. we got to make sure that there's mature people who are in charge of this crazy stuff that's going on here. We need systems and rules and meeting times for things to be able to happen. And in time, the dynamism of the early church plant begins to fossilize into routines and structures and systems. And to be honest, those routines and structures and systems can get a little bit boring. They can become fossilized. And over time, it's easy for love to grow cold in that environment. Not only that, it's easy for things to become less exciting. You're not inviting so many new people to come in. By 40 years, the first generation who planted the church is starting to die off, and their original vision is being lost, but the structures still remain behind them, and there need to be fresh winds of energy to step in, where people would be willing to grow and take some new risks. In older churches, secondary issues oftentimes raise up to become primary issues, and things that were exciting have now become stagnant. Now, you may be saying, hmm, this is very interesting. How old is Christ Community Church, right? I don't know if you guys know, but this year we are going to celebrate our 96th anniversary at Christ Community Church. 96 years, yeah. And one of the things that's amazing to me about Christ Community is how alive and vibrant things are, even after 96 years. I mean, it's an amazing thing for a church to get past their first generation of leaders, like the 1960s, but for things to be still growing, churches being planted, lost people being reached, disciples being made, kids being raised upright, missionaries being sent out to the ends of the earth, that's exciting stuff that we get to be a part of, amen? But I do think that we have some of the very same dangers as other churches that are becoming older churches. And I think we should look and see, are there any parallels between what's going on with us and what was happening during the time of of the Ephesians? So, first of all, Jesus begins giving them credit for stuff, right? He says, hey, good job on hard work and perseverance. You've lived through a lot of bad stuff as the local church, and I want to give you props for that. At this point, Paul, their founder, has been jailed and eventually killed. Timothy, their young new bishop, is in his 70s. John is exiled. And they're still doing work. They're still doing ministry. Even though they've had riots and people have opposed them, they have persevered and they continue to work. And Jesus says to them, way to go, way to keep working, way to keep on doing ministry. Second thing he gives them props for is that they have no tolerance for wicked men. No tolerance for wicked men. They've had 40 years of great leaders at their church who have continued to lead well, and they haven't let wicked men get in there. Now, we didn't have a time to take a look at First and Second Timothy, but one of the things you'll notice in First and Second Timothy is that they name particular wicked men that tried to get the church off track. People with names like Alexander the Metal Worker and Phygelus and Hermogenes and names that you never hear in the church because they were the wicked guys that tried to get people off track. And John is saying, or Jesus is saying through John, good job not following the wicked guys. Good job being faithful to my word and always staying on track. And then the last thing he gives them credit for is he says, you hate the Nicolaitans. Quick show of hands, how many people here know who the Nicolaitans are? Nicolaitans of ancient Asia Minor. Nobody? I don't either. I have no idea who the Nicolaitans are. 
And uh, when I was doing my research this week, really nobody knows who the Nicolaitans are. It's, a, it's an obscure uh, reference to people that there's some speculation about, but scholars don't even know who the Nicolaitans are. But we know they were bad dudes. And the good news is that the church of Ephesus didn't follow the bad dudes, didn't follow the bad dudes, did not follow the Nicolaitans. So the church is doing well in many different regards, but there's one big deal that they're holding out on. One big thing. It says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I first memorized this in the NIV 1984 where it says, you have forsaken your first love. And I thought, oh, what a tragedy when you forget your first love. And that's what happened for the people in the city of Ephesus. Now, this translation is actually probably closer to the original Greek. You've forsaken the love you had at first, and it includes not only the love of God himself, but the love that you had for each other at first, and perhaps the love you have for the mission of God at first. Love of God, love of people, love of the mission. And for Paul, he says, if you're missing love, it's a huge tragedy because love is central to the Christian existence. Christianity without love is just rules and regulations. It's, it's just rituals and systems, and it's the same thing over and over again. Christianity without love is empty. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for a friend. And the greatest commandment is that you would love God with your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul said, that these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is? Love. It's love. The greatest of these is love. Man, if you're missing the love connection, if your love has grown cold, you're missing out on the full enterprise of what God has called you to. Let's assume that all of these are the case, and this is a very big deal. And Jesus says, look how far you've fallen. Uh, my world, my existence, my ideas without love are so empty that if you're not careful, if you don't correct this one, I'm taking the lampstand away. In other words, I'm shutting down the church because churches without love should not exist. And we've seen that pattern happen throughout history. When churches grow tired and loveless, they move into decline and decay and eventually go away. Jesus takes away their lampstand. And so for us as followers of Jesus, keeping our love quotient high is critical because Jesus made us for love and not for religion. So I want to talk for a few minutes today to people who have been around for a long time at Christ Community Church. I'm not ignoring our new people, our friends, our guests, our visitors who are here, but this passage is geared towards people who have been in a church for 40 years. So if you've been in a Christ Community for 40 years or 30 years or 20 years or 10 years, if you've been around a long time... I want you to do a little evaluation of how's your love factor doing? How's your love factor doing? And now I'm going to give you three love tests to be able to say, is your love burning hot? Love test number one is reach one more. Okay, the reach one more test. Love test number one, reach one more. I want to ask the question, when is the last time that you engaged with somebody new at Christ Community Church? Because here's what oftentimes happens with church people. They start coming to church the very first time. They join into a group. They get to know those people in that group. And those are the same people that they hang out with forever until that group becomes smaller and smaller. And then they have very few friends that they hang out with in the church anymore. But we all need to be constantly thinking about how do I reach one more? So let me ask you this question. When is the last time you invited somebody who's newer to the church to your house for dinner? When is the last time, or for lunch, or if you don't do hospitality at your house, when is the last time you invited them out for dinner with you, wherever you tend to hang out? When is the last time you invited somebody from the outside to engage with you as a social insider? This is a big deal for a new person. I remember when Kelly and I first went to Windsor Road Christian Church when we were in Champaign, Illinois. We were about 22 years old, and uh, we were just first-time attenders at this church hoping we could meet some cool people. And there was this one couple that was really old that invited us over for a game night at their house. I mean, they were like 26, 27 years old. 
And they invited us to come over, and all of a sudden, something happened. That no longer were we the outside visitors, but we were the cool insiders all of a sudden. Man, that happens when people who have been around a long time invite new people in. So when is the last time you were intentional about reaching one more person inside the church? But let me ask you this one as well. When's the last time you were intentional about reaching one more person outside the church? When's the last time that you loved somebody so much you said, oh, I got to introduce you to Jesus. I got to introduce you to my church because what he can do to transform your life is so exciting. And they sat next to you in a seat right here in Access and began to grow in their faith. Love test number one, reach one more. How are you doing with that? Are you reaching one more person or are you kind of content with the same old relationships? The same old relationships, trust me, in a church become stagnant and it's easy for love to grow cold over time if you're not also reaching out to somebody new. Love test number two. Love test number two is your attitude towards God. Your attitude towards God. So when you think about this, do you look forward to meeting with God every day? Do you look forward to having the opportunity to clear some space out and to pray? Are you excited about the chance to open up God's word and discover new nuggets of truth and make new connections throughout your understanding of the Bible? Do your eyes sparkle when you talk about God? Is it obvious to your friends and neighbors and co-workers that you're in love with God, that anybody who you meet they know that that's the case for you. Love test number two is your attitude towards God. How are you connecting with him? How are you doing on that one? Good, bad, somewhere in the middle? Last love test, love test number three is being vulnerable to pain. Being vulnerable to pain, loving till it hurts. Here's one of the interesting things that I note about people who attend church for a long time. Oftentimes, when you very first come to a church, you jump into community, a Sunday school class, a journey group, something that will uh, help you to get connected. And you find that group of people that you love and you bond with, and you raise your kids together and visit each other in the hospital and help one another to move, which is the true show of love, right? (laughs) But over time, over time, uh, you know, things happen that change in people's lives, And that one group that was really, really close for one reason or another begins drifting away. Maybe somebody moves out of town. Maybe somebody changes churches for good reasons or for bad reasons. Maybe there's conflict inside of the group and and somebody wounds you. They hurt you in particular. And maybe they gossip about you or treat you unfairly along the way. And the natural thing for human beings to do when they were at one point intimate and then they get hurt is to close themselves up and not allow themselves to be vulnerable anymore. But this is not the way that Jesus would have us interact. As followers of Jesus, even after being hurt in love, he says, extend yourself in love one more time and you probably will be hurt once again. But it's not a reason to stop loving It's a reason to continue to love people despite the pain. Kevin Harney tells a great story in his book uh, called Organic Outreach. It's a scenario where he says, put yourself in this scenario. Imagine yourself coming out of a restaurant with your spouse or somebody you're hanging out with, and while you're coming out, you catch a kid with a handful of keys scraping it across the side of your car. And he's like busted in the act. You can hear the scrape. The paint is still flying. It's alive and in motion. And you see that kid and you have the opportunity to respond. What are you going to do? Well, the just thing to do would be to call the cops on the kid, right? And to make sure that he pays for that, both in terms of finances and in terms of whatever the appropriate punishment is for a kid that age. But imagine if he looks up to you and he goes, I'm so sorry, as soon as he sees you walking up, would you maybe have the heart to look at him and say, you know what, there's a restaurant right here. Let me take you out to dinner and get to know you a little bit and and talk about what you just did to my car. And you begin to enter into a relationship with him and, and, and help him to be able to get over whatever issues that's causing him to want to key random strangers' cars. What if you took it a step beyond that and at the end of the dinner, You decided to give the kid your car. Who's ready for that? That would be crazy. That would be radical. But the truth of the matter is that's the difference between forgiveness 
saying, hey, I'm not going to hold you accountable for the things that you've done that are wrong, and grace. Grace is all about giving you that which you don't deserve even after you offended me. And when we take a look at the cosmic scale, this is exactly what God has done for us. When we took our proverbial keys and scraped them across the Son of God, he showed up and he said, not only will I forgive you for what you've done, but I'll give you a great gift. God gave us a gift that's way better than any car. He gave us his one and only son who would die for us. And Jesus stretches out his arms. And you talk about a place of vulnerability. I mean, this is about the most vulnerable pose that you can have. And when Jesus hangs on the cross, he absorbs the pain of all humanity. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, that's the posture he asks us to take, is a posture of absorbing the pain of those who are around us and continuing to hold our arms out in love towards people. Even though we know we may be hurt one more time. So let me ask you, are you in a risk-taking posture where you, in fact, might get hurt? If you're somebody who says, I'm not in any of those kinds of positions, I have not been loving well, I've been kind of stagnant, then maybe it's time for you to launch a new group here at Christ Community Church. Maybe it's time for you to not just reach one more, to reach five more and be a leader of a journey group that helps people to become disciples. It's a great way to break out of that stagnancy and become refreshed in your love as you head towards the future. Love is going to have loss and pain. Americans oftentimes have this strange idea that we should be living pain-free lives. And so we run from our pain in every moment that we possibly can. The rest of the world is very different in this regard. The rest of the world sees pain as something that's normal, but we see it as something to avoid. But love is always willing to take the pain and take the risk and love again. Amen? Well, John continues on. After he says, hey, you've lost your first love, you got to be able to get that back. There's a promise that comes at the end. And the end is, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You know what he's talking about when he's talking about the tree of life, right? He's talking about the new city, the new heavens, and the new earth, which he promises at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and chapter 22. It's a place where there is no more mourning or crying or tears or pain, where the old order of things has gone away and the new order has come, where God is sitting on the throne, where the streets are made of gold, where there's precious jewels and, and all kinds of precious things all over the place. It's a city where they don't need a lamppost because God himself is so present, he is the light of the city. And running right through the middle of the city is the river of life water that never runs out. And on both sides of the water of life is the tree of life, a tree that bears fruit in 12 seasons, meaning that there is going to be abundance forever and ever. It's a place where beauty, order, and abundance will be normal. And most of all, it's a place where Jesus will reign. And he says, guys, if you keep the love factor on high, if you persevere until the very end, if you keep on serving me, what's in store for you is the tree of life. And this is good news. Amen? Come on. This is good news. A highly clappable good news. God has a destiny that he has in mind for us, and he wants us to head there by being his people, people of love. So I'm going to invite you to stand at this point as we close, and uh, at the very end of Revelation, there's some uh, great comments. Uh, I didn't mark it. I'll see if I can find it here for you. Some very, uh, there's some great comments that Jesus uh, says to them as an invitation, and hear these words as our benediction. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let that one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life, come the invitation of God for every single one of you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you have invited us to come, 
Because every single person matters to God. You've given us this great word for the church of Ephesus, which I think is for the church of today. God, may our love for you and our love for one another burn hot. Will you help us to reach one more, have an attitude of love towards you, God, and to allow ourselves to be vulnerable so that once again you might be glorified in our life and in this church and in this city, both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys. See you next week.